put out that the sun shines down its power to all the world and makes the wind blow strong as it will. I want to hope gentle rains can fall upon the land so lovely earth can stay lovely still. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to the 395, 395th edition of Energy Week with George Harvey and the astonishing Tom Fennell. Absolutely. You're supposed to say in the flesh. What can I say? I, I, I always start this show out explaining that it comes from my blog, geoharvey.com, and you can get to the articles that we talk about either there or um, there's a file that's posted online by BCTV. Um, and, you know, there, there's various ways that you can get to these. We're starting on the, no, on the 19th of November. And so if there's a, if there's a show, a, a, um, an article that you want to read, uh, we'll try to keep you apprised of what the, what the date is. And you go to the geoharvey.com on that date and uh, by clicking on the calendar and then pick the show from the, from the um, ones that uh, pick the article from the ones that come up. I Something have to... weird going on here. This one's from the BBC. What's that? And it happened last week, and it's happening again. I click on the BBC, and I get a blank page. So if oh. you're looking for this ad, you may have to. Or if you're looking for this this particular uh, article, you may have to uh, search for it. Yeah, well, I'm sorry for that. I'll take a look at hey, that. Hey, well, ain't you doing it. It's something's wrong with BBC. Yeah. Um, I should continue, uh, Tom, by asking people to uh, throw tons of money at us. It, the money is not for us. It's actually for well, BBC. We'll settle for thousands of pounds. It doesn't have to what be we fun. Need is What we need is 300 I think $300 is what Cor said, which means that one person could do it by just giving $25 a month. And then when we get that, we don't have to ask people anymore. Wouldn't that be nice? The I'm way you do it is, stay in, in, in Saudi. Yeah. The way you do it is I go to go to brattleboro.tv.org, and on the home page down at the bottom, there's a series of little gray boxes, and you look in one of those boxes, and it, boxes and it says support local television. Click on that, and then that will give you a way that you can donate either uh, by PayPal or by um, uh, credit card. And when you do and you fill in the amount, a little bit below the amount box on the screen is a thing that says messages, and you would have to put in that this is for Energy Week in order for it to be credited to us. If we don't get the money that we need for this, then we're going to have to come up with it out of our own pockets. And I know Tom doesn't have very deep pockets, and neither do I, but one way or another, we're going to keep the show going. Anyway, you ready to start, Tom? Might as well. Okay. Our first article comes from the BBC, and it has a picture of a young lady, which is called an elderly lady in the, in <laughs> at Wikimedia Commons, but it's a, a lady riding a bike in Boston, and what do you have for title? How bike-friendly slow streets, and that's in quote, are changing cities. Yeah, biking is having a renaissance with COVID-19 as urbanites worldwide shun pa public transportation for the relative safely, safety of a two-wheeled commute. The resulting urban planning experiments could not only radically alter the way we commute, it, um, but also make cities more resilient to future shocks. Well, from the article, and it's, a, it's good advice. The car doesn't have to be the default. Yes, that's true. The car doesn't have to be the default. And a lot of people can just walk. You know? Hey! That sounds like a clever idea. I wonder why I, wonder why I never thought of it. Well, I, I don't have a car, and I, I have a bike, but I haven't felt like I could afford to repair it. You anymore. walk a lot. That's good. It's good for you. I walk a lot, yeah. Although... I have to say, with COVID-19, I'm trying to restrict the number of places I'm going. So I don't walk quite as much as I had been, but I walk. 
Well, I just got a very, very good deal on a treadmill, so I got it installed in my house. So I do, I try to do at least five minutes of walking every day on a treadmill. Good for you, Tom. Yeah. Should we go on to the next one? Might as well. We have a we have a picture of a wind farm, and um, that's what I, it looks like to me. Yeah, with mountains in the background. This is from OilPrice.com. It's a nice picture of a wind farm, isn't it? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Why? Yeah. 2021 will be a better year for renewable energy in the U.S. I don't think the, it's just the U.S. It's going to be all around. All around the world, yeah. With a global shift to renewable energy in full swing, which party controls the Senate might not matter that much for energy. Goldman Sachs predicted that capital spending on renewable energy will surpass that of fossil fuels in 2021 globally, and the United States has the same market pressure, so it's going to do the same thing. Well, what's going on here is renewable energy costs are declining rapidly. Yeah. The article mentions that photovoltaics have fallen 82%, and wind shear, uh, onshore wind has declined 39%. That's significant. <laughs> And 82%. It says these trends are expected to continue. Yeah, it means that that $100,000 car you've been drooling over all of a sudden costs $18,000. <laughs> well, that's one way of looking at it. Yeah. Uh, you got more on that? Uh, let's move on. Okay, we have an item from flaglerlive.com. This is the first time we've had one from that particular publication. And we have a picture of Miami with a well, lot of Flagler water. Flagler was the guy who really developed Florida. Oh, okay. And when you get down there, there's a lot of Flagler things. Flagler College and Flagler County and Flagler this and Flagler that. You know, I never knew that. Of course, I've never been in Florida. The last, yeah, the only Florida? My goodness, that's amazing. Never been in it, Florida. It's a nice place. Well, the closest I ever got was Atlanta. That's not too far. No. Yeah. Okay. Well, let's move on here. And finally, confronting warming, Florida lawmakers set to address rising seas and flooding systematically. And we've been talking about uh, Miami getting flooded regularly. That that car that we're looking at there is driving through salt water. That is not good for it. I don't that's, think so. It's a flat-out disaster. I'm, sure, I'm amazed it can go that far. I'm thinking it might be an electric car because uh, uh, an ignition, it's got to be an electric or diesel because an ignition car would shot, short right out. Well, that might be, but I'll tell you, the the floor of this thing is going to rust right out if it isn't cleaned up pretty well. For and, sure. Okay, comments by Republican leaders coming after they were sworn in to lead the Florida House and Senate for the next two years represented a further evolution in the position of the state's Republicans about climate change. The Republican Party in Florida is very rapidly getting to a point where they're saying, we have to talk about this. This is a big problem. Well, according to the article, they plan to establish programs that, ex that address the increased impacts of rising sea levels, but they avoid tackling what's actually causing the problem in the first place. Okay. He's talking about Republicans here. Yeah, I know. I know. So somebody's hitting you the, on, a, on the head with a hammer, and your solution is to take an aspirin. <laughs> That's a good, good metaphor. Okay. Well, we got a nice picture coming up here of sargassum weeds. Which is a type of brown seaweed. We are up to Friday, November 20th, and uh, we have an item from the BBC. What do you have for a title for that, Tom? The seaweed swamping the Atlantic Ocean. You know, when I read this, I was absolutely astonished. Um, I imagine you probably were too, Tom. In the, in the summer of 2018, an almost incomprehensibly large mass of stringy brown seaweed appeared in the Atlantic Ocean. That mass of seaweed stretched f across the Atlantic Ocean from the shores of West Africa to the Gulf of Mexico. It is part of a pattern that was established itself in 2011, and it's getting worse. Well, this sargassum is quite common all around the New England waters. Yeah. Uh, you'd notice it because there's bubbles built into the stems of these things to float them. 
Yeah, you can see it very clearly in the photograph. There's a little round. You can see the bubbles in the picture, right? Yeah, they are not peas. They're they're actually just little. They're they're little tiny air uh, bladders of air that exactly uh, right. Keep this from keep this floating. There, you know, well, this this particular uh, bloom is spectacular. It's spanning five thousand miles. It's the largest ever recorded. And they estimated its mass to be heavier than 200 aircraft carriers. <laughs> this is big, baby. This is big. Um, and one of the things that I, I, you know, I looked into this to see, is there anything we could do with that sargassum? Because there are people mentioned in the article who are doing things. One of the things that they're talking about is feeding it to goats. Exactly. I was just going to say, well, they, can, they, they use it for animal feed. They can use it for biofuels. They can make paper out of it and use it for building materials. So it's, it, it, it's got a niche it can, it can use. It's just we've never had so much of this to deal with. That's right. It happens that people, human beings, you and I, could eat that stuff. It yes, we can. I have. Have you? It well, looks I just munched on it. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah? Uh, well, yeah. I've, I've eaten huh? a lot of kelp. I've eaten kelp, but I've never had sargassum. <laughs> I was a lifeguard, you know. We used to grab a piece, a hunk of that, and chew on it. Really? Wow. Okay. Should we should we move away from there? Yeah, I think we can. We got a picture of a trawler here. A, tr- a fishing boat. It says fishing boat. Will, yeah. I will tell you know. Yeah, I look at that. Trawler, I don't know. It looks like they're 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 equipped to haul nets. Yeah, well, in any case, like. what it what it says is fishing saps. The ocean's power to capture carbon. Never thought of that before. Yeah, you know, Tom, this is an article that I'm not, I, I'm not convinced by. Let me read what it says. A fish that dies naturally in the ocean sinks to the depths, taking with it all the carbon it contains. When a fish is caught, most of the carbon is released into the atmosphere as carbon dioxide. Carbon emissions from fishing are 25% higher than what had been consi- uh, considered to come from fuel consumption. And the the premise that a fish dying naturally in the ocean will sink to the bottom by itself strikes me as having something wrong with it. Well, if it makes it to the bottom, it's not. It's still going to decompose and it's going to release CO2. Yeah, and but the thing is, it's not going to make it to the bottom most of the time. In fact, no, someone's going to eat it. <laughs> Somebody's going to eat it, that's right. And uh, so we, I, th- I think it's more complicated than this article. I think this is oversimplified, but I'll give you a quick takeaway. Industrial yeah. fishing emits CO2 in two ways. The boats burn fuel, duh. And in addition, by extracting fish from the sea, they release CO2, which would otherwise remain buried in a seabed. Well, it's that buried in the seabed part that I feel very unsure. I, I think that's a little bit of an exaggeration. I think so. The 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 people who this this article was based on a study, and the people who did the study may have gone into more depth than this. And I think the article might be simplifying it a bit too much. So is I wouldn't bet against. A, yeah, have we had a, enough of that particular issue? Yeah, let's move along here. we got a picture of a Cadillac Lyric. Cadillac Lyric in an article from Clean Technica. What do you got for GM time? raises its EV game, commits another $7 billion to its electric car push. I'll just mention that they have been lagging. They they have been, but they're trying to make up for it from everything else. Yeah, absolutely. Well, they realize what's going on. Tess was eating yeah. their lunch. That's right. Uh, Tesla is worth um, about five hundred million dollars right now. And it started from nothing. Yeah, I mean, this was just a guy, and and he had a vision, and he didn't even want to make cars; he wanted to make batteries. So you know, uh, anyway, well, he's going to start making batteries now. Yeah, right. General Motors announced it is adding seven billion dollars to its mission to bring electric cars to market. General Motors had already committed $20 billion to its EV program, so the $7 billion is in addition to that. 
CEO Mary Barra said GM will offer 30 battery electric models globally by the middle of this decade. And well, they're going to offer these EVs at all price levels. Yeah, they do. And most of them were, are going to be based on, upon the same basic platform, which they call Ultium. And it uses yes. standard battery cells and a set of interchangeable propulsion components to power either mass market offerings or high performance vehicles. Yeah. So they're yeah. serious about this. They are. And you know, one thing that people who people who don't pay attention to EVs should should pay attention to, and you know, you just mentioned it now. High performance. Um there's a, uh, well, there's, you get you get maximum current when you step on the maximum power when well, you step on the gas. Do you remember in an Tom, internal combustion engine? You don't get maximum power till it's revved up. Yeah, yeah. you remember the 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 um, Shelby Cobra? I certainly do. Okay, we'll talk about this next week because it appeared today. Oh, good. Um, the there's a company called um, Superformance. And they make super super performing cars, and they are coming out. They claim that they actually own the right to have a car that is called a Shelby Cobra. They own the, the trademark. Okay. And they are introducing a Shelby Cobra, which does not have a, a, a scoop on the hood, and it doesn't have exhaust pipes running down the side. But it's basically, other than that, it's the Shelby Cobra. And they should put them on there just for decoration. <laughs> yeah, and it's powered by electric. And this thing looks like it is unbelievable in terms of its its um, in terms of its uh, ability to to perform. And you know, Superformance is known for exactly that. So we'll see what happens. But okay, zero to sixty in two seconds, huh? I don't know, but I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, this is <laughs> that's swift. Yeah, and and you know, I I know a, I know a fellow who was riding an electric motorcycle, and he came up a, a, among a whole group of of guys on motorcycles who looked very tough. And of course, he was on a on a cycle. He left made him in his dust. He he just left them behind. Yeah, that's what I said. <laughs> And he did it noiselessly. So, <laughs> well, anyway. the next one coming up says that we were talking about NOAA, weren't we? NOAA research shows climate, climate crisis primary cause of 98% of the dead Florida coral reef. This is We've been reading about coral reefs being in trouble, and, and most of the time it's the Great Barrier Reef in Aust uh, just north of Australia. This is a this is reefs off the U.S. coast that are being hit. Uh, for, uh, well, that particular is, picture comes from the Florida Keys. Yes, and, and that is bleached coral. Absolutely. First, first of its kind federal report on health of U.S. coral reefs finds that in Florida, the area with the worst degradation, up to 98 percent of coral reefs have been lost, due mainly to climate change. The researchers used data collected from 2012 to 2018. You know, if if the, these reefs are are central to to the ecology of these areas, this is a disaster. This is a well, real disaster. The fish love them. The, if you if you look at pictures of divers in Florida in uh, in uh, uh, around coral reefs, they always have lots of fish around. Look Absolutely. The fish, like I just said, the fish love them. There's no fish in that picture. This is weird. <laughs> really. They don't, you know, the Plus, fish... Must, maybe it was a holiday. Oh, man. The fish... Well, the, ocean the, warming, overexposure to sunlight, and acidification brought on by the climate crisis and the continued release of carbon dioxide into the environment were named as the primary threats to reef health. I, I cannot imagine what they're going to do to restore those reefs, if they're going to restore them. And if they are not, then they're going to have to bear the consequences of that. Because this is, um, you know, these reefs are, are constantly building the, the ocean bed up in areas that otherwise would be exposed to erosion. And 
the, you know, the fish that live in them are are part of a system that supplies us with food. This is bad. Well, if you look at the Atlantic coast, almost all of the Atlantic Ocean from New York down has these barrier islands. Yes. And all a barrier island really is is a mature reef. Yeah. It started yeah. as a reef and it just grew, and now they're big enough to have highways on them. Yeah, and with with rising waters in the sea, those islands are going to become something else. It's happening already. Yeah. I was looking at, at um, the Marshall Islands the other day. Uh-huh. The Marshall Islands, there's the highest point in the Marshall Islands is something like seven feet above sea level. I was going to say six feet, but I'm not going to argue with you. Yeah, and these people who live there live in a you know a tropical paradise and it's not it's they're all scratching their heads and wondering where they are going to move to because their entire country is going to be lost and they know it and who is doing nothing about it well among other people the united states unfortunately unfortunately okay we're well, here's a nice that. picture of what they call agrovoltaics right and this it's is this uh, from Saturday, no, November 21st. Thank you. And it's talking about Enel Green Power, which promotes sustainability at solar plants in the U.S. Yeah. And Enel is a uh, Italian energy company. It's an Italian company. It's actually the largest utility in Europe. I just it could very really well be, and they specialize in green energy. They do indeed. Um, and the, and the, again, there's an article we're going to be talking about next week that has unbelievable amount of investment they're planning on putting into um, into uh, green energy. This article is from Clean Technica. There has been opposition to solar installations from farmers in some parts of the United States. Efforts from companies like NL Green Power show how solar and farming can coexist and benefit each other while helping to bring more renewable energy to America. This is a situation where, and it's same, the same thing is true of wind farms, a farmer can lease land for solar PVs and then plant crops under the PVs. And what we're seeing here is wildflowers. And I was look, thinking exactly that when I was reading the article. My goodness, they can grow all sorts of vegetables under, under those uh, PVs, and some of them grow faster and better. And they almost all of them save on water. Yes, that's right. It it actually can cut the it it depend different things are going to grow differently with the solar panels around, but it can cut costs. Absolutely. If you look, if you look at that picture, by the way, there's a couple of of butterflies in there that are visiting those flowers. Yes, yes, that's true. Um, They're visiting goldenrod, huh? Yeah, and one of the things that that I looked into was. Um, uh, the the chemicals that can come off of these um, photovoltaic panels uh, when they're exposed to rain, and the particular panel that I was looking into, which is this the um, Panasonic HIT, really there is nothing that can come off that panel that could cause any environmental damage. Well, um, most of the panels that you could buy today are glass enclosed. Yes, they're they're basically vitrified. And then the glass has got some unusual properties because there are things in it that you would not normally find in glass. But there are also things that garden soil has typically got in it in large amounts already, things like phosphorus. Um, so it's it, it's not a problem. There are solar panels that have cadmium in them. Uh-huh. Uh, my, my yeah, understand- but there's, like I said, they're enca- encapsulated, enclosed by glass. Right, and they th- those panels will not work in Vermont. I'm told they're they're that's per- so. Per- well, they they perform well in hot environments, and and they don't perform well in Vermont. Well, there's a four minute video at Queen Technical that's interesting. Yeah, and there's also a little bit that's interesting. This company Enel operates a hydro plant in Sheldon Springs in northwestern Vermont, which is almost in Canada. It's okay. on the Missisquoi River. And it's got a 25 megawatt solar farm attached to it. <laughs> oh, isn't that fun? Yeah. Okay. Bringing it next... locally, bringing it home to, to roost here. Farmers right. tend to think that the solar panels do something harmful to the land, and 
that may be true, but they're going to have to be changing their mind about that because, as the next say, combining solar and agriculture can increase the productivity. Of By a large amount. Absolutely. Big, it's like 60%. What farmer would... I was going to say 80, and it doesn't quite double it, but it's, it's, it's a good investment. It's a good, and, and they don't even have to make an investment. They can have somebody come in, put in the panels, and pay them a, a, a lease on it, which means that they don't have an investment. They just make money. And the same thing is true of wind turbines. There are people who, I, I've talked to people who have had wind turbines put on the, in on the property. and it didn't cost like, them anything, huh? didn't cost them anything. They had to give up a couple of hundred square feet of land that, you know, that they're no longer able to farm because it's too close to the wind turbine. But the, the wind turbine is paying them thousands of dollars a year just for being there. And, uh, the somebody, amount of land that they take up is very small. Very small. That's correct, yes. So, um, should we go on? Let's see if i got any notes worth, worth mentioning here. Okay, good idea. Well, they talk about hosting sheep grazing, which you knew about. We knew about that. We just see as a final word, as much more can be done by integration. And yes. it's going to happen. It just makes too much sense. Yes, that's right. So our next item is from Clean Technica, and we have a picture of a Proterra electric bus. And Proterra, by the way, is an American company. It is, and it's probably the biggest electric bus man manufacturer in the United States, although BYD put in a factory in California, and it might be making more than Proterra now. I don't know. But what well, do you I have don't know that either. Well, Proterra sells its 1,000th electric bus. Now they're talking about worldwide, I think. Yeah, yeah. Uh, but most of their sales are in the United States. And Canada. Most of them are in the U.S., absolutely. If you compare, uh, we've done it on the show, with electric buses in China and electric buses in the U.S. Oh, man. <laughs> they're not in the same ballpark. No, they're not. Uh, the United States, had, when... When Bloomberg NEF did a, an inventory of American electric buses, they found something like 650 of them. And um, that was about six months or eight months ago. There's 16,300 plus in the Chinese city of Shenzhen. Oh. Where is Shenzhen? Where is it? Where is Shenzhen? How many people know where Shenzhen is? Well, it's near Shanghai and it's built as an industrial city. Yeah, yeah. It's not my a natural city. It was built to, for industry. Yeah, my understanding was that it was actually north of Hong Kong, but it doesn't really matter. Well, I think no. you're right. I think you're right. It is north of, right near Hong Kong. But when I, the first time I came across references to Shenzhen, it was because BYD was there, and I had never heard of it before. And I thought, what in the world is this? They got sixteen thousand. Um, they have 16,300 electric buses in a village of, full of people who are out in their, in their um, conical hats planting rice and patties. You know, this doesn't our, – our vision of China today does not necessarily make sense. Let me read the synopsis here. U.S.-based electric bus company Proterra, which was first mentioned in Clean Technica in 2013 – this is not that old – has passed a major milestone, selling its thousandth electric bus. This comes just a bit more than three years after the hundredth electric bus was delivered. <clears throat> so it took from 2013 to 2017 to make a hundred buses. 2017 to 2009 uh, uh, to 2020 to bring that up to a thousand. Um, it, the, it was uh, one of twelve that were sold to Broward County, County Transit in Florida. Hope they well, Broward County is just north of Miami, just south of Palm Beach, and it's known for being the home of Fort Lauderdale. Well, how about that? I hope they <laughs> keep those buses out of the salt water. Yeah. Each 40-foot yeah. bus has a 660-kilowatt-hour battery, which provides more driving range than any other 40-foot electric bus in North America for what that worth. Okay. And it can rev up to 20 miles an hour in less than six seconds, which doesn't sound to me very exciting. <laughs> well, I don't think they're burning rubber doing that. <laughs> okay, you well, want to go on? Here we get a nice picture of a container ship. Yes, and this is an article from Clean Technica. Again, the U.N. Shipping Agency 
greenlights a decade of rising greenhouse gas emissions. Yeah, governments have backtracked on their commitments to urgently reduce green, uh, climate heating emissions from the shipping sector. Environmental organizations have said, following a key meeting of the International Maritime Organization, and this meeting was what they're trying to do is they're trying to find a way for sh shipping to reduce its emissions. The emissions from shipping are awful. They're absolutely awful. I don't know. This what article they, said they're going to allow them to continue being awful. Yeah, and that's why the environmental organizations are so upset. Although we keep seeing these articles about um, hydrogen being used for heavy, heavy trucks and ships, and maybe that'll more happen. and more and more. I'm noticing that uh, five years ago, neither of us was talking about hydrogen, and now it's it's becoming a big part of our show each week. Just about every week, yeah. Okay, we're up to Sunday, November 22nd, and we've got an item here, which is from... Nice picture here. It's a picture of a town called Whittier, Alaska, and I want to call your attention in this picture to the kind of rectangular box that's just above the water on the, rec on the right side of the screen. Underneath that, the mountain. Yeah, that box is a 14-story tall apartment building. That's what it looks and, like, yeah. And every, almost everybody in town lives in that one building. <laughs> Get to know your neighbors, huh? I guess. It was originally put up uh, by the U.S. military. I don't remember what it was for. <laughs> they, um, they switched uh, after, uh, actually there was a tsunami before in 1964. That was the day of the Good Friday earthquake. And they switched this to um, uh, civilian use right after that because so many people in the town had lost their homes. Well, I've read about this before, and this is significant. This is a big problem up there. I'll yeah. read the title. Climate okay. change could lead to landslide-triggered tsunami in Alaska, according yeah. to science. Yeah, this is an article in, in Republic World, Whittier, Alaska, has still not forgotten the tsunami of 1964. That was the one I just mentioned, the Good Friday earthquake, uh, uh, earthquake tsunami, which killed 13 people and did $10 million in damages. But another th tsunami threat looms large on the city. This is, is it a city? It's got 220 people in it. With climate change, as Barry Glacier could fall into the ocean, causing a mega tsunami. And a mega tsunami is not an ordinary tsunami. It is a very different thing. Um, and in the, in the case of a worst case scenario mega, mega tsunami, that box, that apartment building, could could be. It could go. A, it, it could have a wave go over it that's five times as tall as it is. Five the, times. Five times the record. And you of, said it's what? Have it fifteen stories? Fourteen stories. The the record height of a mega tsunami is I think seventeen hundred feet. The waves. You're not going to run away from that one. <laughs> You're not. Uh, and that record I think might have been set in Alaska. The problem is that when you have a landslide going into a fjord, the the um, th there's no way to escape th that. Can't get out of it. Can't get out of the way. There was one that happened in Alaska uh, quite a long time ago, and there were four people in the fjord. Two of them were in a fishing boat, and they actually kind of surfed that huge wave out of the out of the, out of the fjord. The other two they never found. But um, these these highly focused mega tsunamis are just unbelievably big. The chance of one happening that the, that's that big probably not very big, but you know. It doesn't have to be all that tall to cause a lot of mischief. Well, there's a big glacier right outside of Whittier called the Barry Glacier. It's 25, 28 miles northeast. And right. the scientists are expecting it to fail in the next 20 years. Right. right. Or fall, not fail. Well, it, it, and it, the it rapid will... retreat of the... This isn't a thing falling into the sea, but it's just a rapid retreat of the glacier could release millions of tons of rocks into the river, again triggering a tsunami. Yes. yes. So there's lots, millions of tons of rocks. 
Okay, that's all kind of distressing, but we've got... Uh, should we go on to the next one? I think I think we got a nice picture there of an MGZS, which is an electric vehicle. Yes, and by the way, MG is an old um, and well-respected British name. The company went bankrupt years ago, but the trademark, MG, was sold to a Chinese company. So MG is operating... Okay, huh? so, so it's just... Chinese owned. MG stands for Morris Garage. Do you remember the Morris Miner? Yes, I do. Yeah, Morris Garage. Yep. And and uh, MG. My my uncle had an MG TC, which was one of those beautiful cars that with the running boards. You know. That was a neat car. That was great. I liked that car. Yeah. One um, one of one of the original real sports cars. Yes, indeed. Um, this article is from Clean Technica. What do you have for a title for the article, Tom? Vehicle, electric vehicle interest surges 500% in the U.K. on news of the 2030 fossil fuel car ban, which okay. I don't think we've talked about, have we? No, we haven't. This is something that's kind of new. Um, the news of the U.K. plan to, and they haven't actually adopted this plan. They're just talking about it now. At least that's my understanding. I think you're right. To ban sales of new gas and diesel cars in 2030 has repeat, reportedly led to a huge increase in interest in electric vehicles. According to buyacar.co.uk, electric vehicle inquiries increased by 700% following the news of the stronger timeline. Now, this is not sales. This is just inquiries. You know, people saying, electric vehicle? What's that all about? And going to Absolutely. The, Internet and finding out, but you know this is a this is a. But huge you know, thing. six months ago, probably half of these people didn't even know there was an electric car. Yeah, I think that's you know people. A lot of people don't pay attention to things, and you know, a lot of people they don't want to know about a car unless it makes noise. And well, for the article, it says electric vehicles are becoming mainstream and will eventually take over the market. Duh. <laughs> well, they are. Yes, absolutely, yeah. and. It, in fact, our next article is also about the same thing. Except, well, let's move to it then. Okay. A picture of the Renault Zoe. That's right. That's what it is. An 18% plug-in vehicle share in Germany in October was a record month. This, is, this is what people are buying in Germany. Yeah, this is not increase. This is actual purchases. The Absolutely. Germans, Plug-in vehicle market set new records in October, reaching 18% market share. Full electric vehicles were up 365% from last year. Plug-in vehicles as a whole were up 303%. Overall, the car market was down 4%. And, of course, the the big declines were in petrol cars, gasoline-powered cars, which are down 30% and diesel cars that are down 19%. <clears throat> this is a shift that is underway. I think people are starting to become aware of this, and they're looking at it and saying, I don't, I don't want to buy something that's going to be obsolete in 10 years. Yeah. I mean, if you think about it, if they stop selling um, gasoline-powered cars, they're going to stop selling gasoline not all that long afterwards. And when that happens, it's going to get harder and harder to keep an old car going. Absolutely. Yeah. And I got an old car. <laughs> I know what you're talking about. Yeah, but you don't use gasoline. You use... Um... I, I, I do for the wintertime. Oh, do but you? I don't use gasoline. I use diesel fuel. Yeah, okay. In the summertime, I use, uh, I use veggie oil from restaurants. Okay. Okay. So we're up to Monday, free. November 23rd. What? It's free. All we got to do is, is filter it. <laughs> yes. We're up to Monday, November 23rd, and we have an item here from Clean Technica. And a nice picture, picture of, of a Hyundai fuel cell truck. Oh, about that. That's a big truck. It looks like it's a big truck to me. And here's well, hydrogen of- power for heavy trucks in China and all the ships at sea. Yes. In a 15-year plan for new energy vehicles, China's state council put a focus on building fuel cell supply chain and hydrogen-powered heavy vehicles. The wind and, a wind and solar plant in Inner Mongolia 
is expected to produce up to 500,000 tons of hydrogen a year beginning next year. So that's green hydrogen. <laughs> What's that? That's green hydrogen. That's green hydrogen. Just think about this. Hydrogen is the lightest substance we know of, and there's yep. going to be making 500,000 tons of it a year. <coughs> I can't comprehend what that really means. Well, I looked and found out that the that the worldwide production of hydrogen is something like 70 million tons. So this is this is a significant part of that, but it's not as much as one percent. But 500,000 tons of hydrogen. What are they going to do with that? They could. Well, they could one thing is China is building a network of hydrogen refuel refueling stations for right. hydrogen powered trucks and buses. And so that's what they're going to have. They're going to have these fueling stations, and all of a sudden it's going to make really good sense to have uh, hydrogen uh, vehicles around. And, of course, when the hydrogen burns or is however you're going to put through a fuel cell or whatever to make power for a vehicle or from for a ship or for anything else, and they go into ships in detail in this, or more detail than you and I. I was have. just going to mention that in Norway they're creating a retrofitable hydrogen propulsion system for large ships. Yeah, and when that happens, instead of emitting smoke and carbon dioxide and all kinds of nasty things you don't want, they really only have one product, and that's water. Water, just plain water, not yeah. even salt water. Not even salt water. That's right. I've thought well, that maybe the article says that maritime emissions constitute about two and a half percent of global greenhouse gas. Yeah, but you know, that doesn't not, sound like much, but it's significant. It is significant, and they are particularly bad emissions because nobody is regulating them for particulates. Well, Volkswagen's got on the ball. They began using ships powered by liquid natural gas to transport vehicles to North and South America. Yeah, and we had a we had an art, article not that long ago about a company that was building a ship that was wind powered to take. Yeah, care. we did. I remember okay. the picture. Our next item, we don't have a. Oh, yes, we do. Our next item has a graph about the shifts to EVs, and um, it is from Clean Technica. Well, it's called a shift to EVs. Carbon Tracker claims EV revolution will end the oil era. Yeah, carbon You can tracker. see from the graph. You can yeah. see what's going on there, that, what's going down and what's going up. Almost, in, almost what's the right word? <laughs> exponential. Yeah, well, almost, yes, that's right. It is almost exponential. The, the cost of EVs is going down to a point where it doesn't make sense to buy anything else. And um, that that point is one that we have, we, we're up against now. It, it, within a couple of years, it's going to be, even with for immediate costs, without thinking about what the cost will be in the future, it will not make sense to buy, uh, to buy a car unless it's an electric vehicle. But let me read the... Um, the uh, uh, synopsis on this. A carbon oh, tracker says the shift into EVs in emerging, emerging markets will, quote, end oil era, end quote. In particular, it suggests the transition away from gasoline and diesel-powered vehicles in emerging markets, quote, may slash growth in global oil demand by 70%. That is 70%, end quote. The well, one of the things happening in these emerging markets, China, India, Southeast Asia, most of Africa, they expect it to increase oil imports. And guess what's happening? They're going for electric. Yeah. And I think the, the, that's a move that is going to get faster and faster in the near future. And, and it's going to impact. It's going to impact everything. Everything. That's right. Okay, our next item is from Renewables Now, and it has a picture of wind turbines in Wyoming. Nice picture. <laughs> yeah, I, I look at that picture and I say, how do they avoid having those blades crash into each other? <laughs> We're looking at this very, they're very carefully monitored. Right. We're looking <laughs> in this perspective that actually kind of makes that look like they're close together. They're not. They're close not together. as close together as they look. They're 
quite far apart. My guess is that they're probably a hundred yards apart or more. But um, they're also uh, pretty big turbines. They're they're big turbines. This is from Renewables Now. Renewables are 64% of new U.S. electrical generating capacity in the first nine months of 2020. According to a review by the Sunday campaign of data just released by the Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, renewable energy sources dominated new electrical generating capacity additions in the first nine months of 2020. And the, the synopsis that I've got here doesn't mention this, but... The United States in June, July, August, and September, that's four months, 100% of all electric generating capacity put up in those four months was renewable. That's new capacity. That's new capacity. Yep. That's right. So, um, you know, this is we're, we're moving farther and farther in the direction of uh, renewable electricity. Well, um, why continue to pay for fuel when you don't have to? Yep, that's right. Okay, we're up to Tuesday, November 24th, and we have a picture of a, a map of the world that shows the various areas of the world according to how warm they were over the month of Octo- October 2020 compared with normal. The but with the exception of the United, central United States, all the world is getting warmer. Just about, and a lot of it is much warmer. The, the, the kind of pink colors... Um, They've got different uh, degrees of warmth there, correct? But the but the pink colors show uh, much warmer than normal, and the red colors are record. And there's a lot of record warmth there. Look at Turkey, for example, or or um, Greece. You know, the Ukraine. The Ukraine was in record heat, and um, the same is true of of western parts of Brazil. In western parts of the Amazon, you know, this is this is a uh, it's a record. This is from Clean Technica. The world is getting warmer, guys. It is. We have to do super something. hot October drags 2020 toward the second hottest year on record. The the year to date, January through October, ranked the second hottest for the globe, as Arctic sea ice coverage shrank to historic lows for the month, according to to NOAA scientists. The most recent global uh, monthly global uh, cha- climate report from NOAA um, also has other highlights of the climate change. But this is, you know, basically they're saying it's it's here, it's it's bad, it's getting worse. There's some nice uh, maps in this article. Yeah, there are. And it says parts. that the ten warmest Octobers, ten warmest Octobers have occurred since 2005. It's in the ten warmest almost, October. It's, it's more than every. It's almost every year. Yeah. yeah, in the last fifteen years, ten warmest Octobers were in the last fifteen years, and that's since records started. And the records started, I think, in eighteen eighty. So you know, how can you possibly say the climate isn't getting warmer? It's it's mind boggling. You have to shut that's your eyes. That's politics talk and not reality. I uh, I don't know. Okay, our next item is from Clean Technica, and this is, um, I'm sorry, it's a picture of a train. CNN, it's a very unusual train. Absolutely. It's yeah. hydrogen-powered. That's and right. That's what I'm going to tell you. Hydrogen-powered trains could replace diesel engines in Germany. There's an interesting video there, and it's not about the train, it's about hydrogen. Yeah. Siemen, Siemens and Germany's rail operator Deutsche Bahn have announced plans to test a hydrogen-powered train with a range of more than 370 miles, technology that promises to reduce CO2 emissions and help make 1,300 diesel units obsolete. The test is going to last one year. So the thing I want to point out here is that picture that you see is the train they're testing or will be testing. That's a two-car train, and they got a three-car train doing the same thing. And what it is is powered by green hydrogen fuel cells, which are charging batteries. And the batteries right. drive electric motors. And it yeah. can go as fast as 100 miles an hour. That, that, that's good enough, I think. Yeah. People, I think a lot of people who travel in cars and airplanes don't realize how fast trains go. Um, we're kind of, a, a lot of us are accustomed to trains being subways and things like that. 
But I the remember trains in Vermont to... don't go that fast, but along the Atlantic Atlantic seaboard there, they go fast. I was I was taking a train to Washington D.C. some time back. One, it was the Acela. I was take, going from Brattleboro down. That and goes fast. First, it goes fast. It goes fast. Not in Vermont. It, much faster in Vermont than it used to. But that's that's a matter of the condition of the roadbed. When you get down into New Jersey, a conductor was walking by me, and I said, "Excuse me, can you tell me how fast we're going?" And he said, um, "Well, we're going." pretty fast. <laughs> and I said, I, I said, this is really fast. He said, well, how fast do you think we're going? I said, we got to be going over 100 miles an hour. And he said, he kind of smiled and he said, why do you say that? And I said, because we're going by a superhighway and we're leaving those cars on it behind like they're, they're standing still. And he said, yeah, that could be. <laughs> He didn't want to say this train is going 100 miles an hour. I think that would have alarmed people. But Well, you know, trains, at least on a straightaway, even back in the days of steam engines, went fast. They went fast. That's at least right. they could. They could. That's right. Um, and, you know, I, I, I remember asking my father about uh, what was this, uh, the song, Casey Jones. And why couldn't he stop the train? And Dad saying <laughs> the train was going seventy miles an hour, and it had it had iron wheels on on iron rails. This is not like a car with rubber on asphalt. And well, you know, that's what it was. So there you go. Our our next item, that one was from CNN. Well, our next uh, item is from Clean Technica. Yeah, and, and it says, after Scotland tour, Maine hatches offshore floating wind turbines plot. <laughs> yeah, Maine has some deep and challenging waters for, for wind turbines. It also boasts sustained offshore wind speeds that are estimated to be enough to meet its existing electricity demand 36 times over. Governor Janet Mills came away from a tour of Scotland with big plans. And they is it? The article called Maine the Granite State. Yeah, it's wrong. This is New Hampshire is a granite state. Maine's the pine tree state. Yeah. Um, um, Tina Casey, who's the the author of this this particular art- article, writes with a real flair that's unique to herself. Uh huh. She, I I caught that mistake too. <laughs> yeah. No, she made a mistake. What the heck? Well, yeah. floating wind turbines are designed for water that is too deep for conventional platforms. Right. And they're saying here, Maine has excellent wind resources, but deep offshore waters. So this is the yeah. solution. This is the solution. And they've been they've been doing dealing with floating offshore wind turbines, or talking about them uh, for Maine for years, literally. But Japan has a lot of them. Because they don't have a, 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 a long, no. long coastal shelf like we have in the East Coast. Yeah, yeah. And and you know when you look at when you look at the the people in Maine don't like having um, transmission lines running through the uh, through the forests. And quite frankly, I don't blame them. Um, <laughs> I, I don't, agree with you. I don't. Yeah, per- yeah. I don't particularly like for transmission lines. I'd rather have a transmission line running the length of Vermont than having somebody put in a 1,000-megawatt meg- a, a coal-burning power plant, for sure. Oh, for but, sure. Well, but, you know, they could bury these transmission lines in the, alongside the roadways, you know, in, the, in, the, in the, uh, the edge of the roads. Yes. They'd probably they, never have any trouble with them. If you, are you talking about buried transmission lines? Yeah. Yeah, they could do that. They can make 1,000 kV cables now. Yeah. When I was in the cable business, 230 volts was the maximum. Or 230 k. 230 k, and now they're talking about 1,000 k. So they're talking yeah. about a million volts. And they're making, and, re- making them regularly. I mean, that's that's the norm. Yeah, you try frying an egg with that, it's going to turn it to dust. <laughs> <laughs> Okay, we've got our last picture coming up. It's a trampoline. And I was going to say exactly the same thing. This looks like a great <laughs> big water trampoline. 
and you notice that the surface of this thing is not flat. It it is has bulges in it, which tells me that there's probably air caught under that, and you know, there's a boat at the edge, and it says that it's an offshore solar system. And the thing about this is it's not just offshore, it's in the ocean. And this is from PV Magazine International. Floating solar could benefit from EU offshore renewable strategy. And this yeah. is a this is floating solar. They got they just laid out a big carpet in the ocean. Yes. And <laughs> and they put the solar cells on top of it. It makes a lot of sense to me. It does. I wonder what would happen, you know, when this gets hit by a hurricane. Well, I'm sure somebody else besides you and me have thought about it. Well, you know, that's absolutely true. And you remind me of something that happened. I was do I was in a in a in a comment area conversation with a guy about an article that that said that um, the I think it was the railroads in Belgium were going to be were going to be operated um, entirely on solar and wind power, and he got into well the sun doesn't always shine the wind doesn't always blow, and oh you know I I felt like you know sending him a, a message that said. You you know you've got a, a real point here. Maybe you should tell their engineers you, and <laughs> ask, ask, ask for a reward for catching their error. You know, it's, <laughs> these guys have thought about this. They this is not something that's new to them. They they uh, think all of this stuff through. Engineering is not a matter of flipping coins and and coming up with a result. It's this is actual numbers being used. And I think, I you know, Tom, I think people who who have no experience with it really don't understand it at all. I think you're right. They're just numbers that they're throwing around. Well, I'm going to give you a couple of numbers right now. Today's okay. all European offshore wind generation capacity is 12 gigawatts. Yes. The present total worldwide generating capacity is 1,200 gigawatts. Right. So they got to put plenty of of a chance to deploy floating solar. Yeah. And they've got me, technology that they've developed on inland bodies of water, so they know what they're doing already. Yeah. Let me read the, the – have you read the title for this article? I don't know. Floating, I read it again. It's short. Yeah. Floating solar could benefit from EU offshore renewable strategy. I did read that. Okay. While wind power dominates offshore renewable energy strategy unveiled by the European Commission, which envisions 300 gigawatts of floating capacity by 2050, the report also notes various EU funding pots which could support ocean-based solar development. And, you know, I think this is interesting, but 300 gigawatts is a lot. That is a lot. 300 gigawatts is very, very much. Not just very much. It's very, very much. Yeah, of course, we're talking it, about uh, just Europe. Yeah, that's right. And 300 gigawatts of floating offshore wind power is not going to be the same as 300 gigawatts of of um, nuclear power because it's true the wind doesn't always the wind doesn't always blow consistently. So well, they're talking here about capacity, not usage. That's right. This is what they can give you. It's yeah. the max. Yeah. Right, and 300 gigawatts of floating uh, offshore wind capacity is probably equal to about 150 large nuclear power plants. 150 well, one of the problems with uh, PV, the biggest problem with PV, is it takes up a lot of real estate. Which you can now, part grow. of that can be offset by growing things underneath it, but yeah. other than that, find places where the real estate's cheap, like the ocean. Well, or yeah, that's true. Or or the deserts in Australia. Okay, this they're brings, doing that now. They are indeed. This brings us to the to the last slide in our show, which just says, "Have a perfectly lovely week." And I don't have a picture of that slide, but I'll take your word for it. I'm sorry, I should have provided you with one. <laughs> Anyway, Tom and I, I think, are both waving right at this moment to anybody who happened to be able to creep up and look at us. Use your imagination, guys. And we'll see you next time, or you'll see us, or you'll see our slides. Let me put it that way. That's probably most Something accurate. like that. That's a pretty good article, so. 
Yeah. The overall trend is uh, optimistic. I think so, yes. So goodbye, everybody. Adios.